Mark 4, where we continue our study of the gospel according to Peter, which we call the gospel of Mark. We believe that Peter was the apostolic authority behind this, and Mark was simply his assistant. You'll note that the word Mark, or the name Mark, never occurs in the book, as we pointed out earlier. But anyway, on this Reformation Sunday, let us give special thanks to God that the fact that we can sit here today and have Bibles in front of us and have a Bible study, that is a blessing given to us through the Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation, because the Pope's church doesn't want you to have a Bible. The official teaching of the Roman church is you can't understand the Bible. You shouldn't have a Bible because you'd, you'd misuse it. Let the pros there in Rome, they'll study it for you. That's all you need. Just do what they say. That's what Luther grew up with. Uh, but thanks be to God, he saw the light and gave us back the Bible. So we're doing today what Luther wanted his church to do. Get the Bibles out. Read Mark, study them. In Mark 4, there's that little section here, verses 33 and 34, that we want to look at. As you know, uh, the beginning of Mark 4 has four parables beginning with that famous parable of the different soils, the four different soils. And then the three other parables there that we've looked at. Uh, and this is kind of a, a wrap up. Uh, these two verses are a summary of that, that uh, Jesus used parables all the time. So let's read these two verses and uh, make comment on them. Verse 33, and with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Okay, well, just briefly in regard to verse 33, of course, the word is the word of God. Uh, the Bible, we would have it as today the inspired writings of the prophets and apostles, Old and New Testament. Very often in the book of Mark, the word of God is called simply the word, as we saw earlier in these parables in this chapter. And Jesus is the one who was before them speaking these parables. And Jesus is God, so everything Jesus said is the word of God also. He is God himself. And as, he, and as it says here in verse 33, as they were able to hear it. The Bible teaches us that it's a, it's a big book. It's actually 66 books written over a period of 1,600 years. Uh, and all written by the same Holy Ghost. Uh, and it all is in perfect agreement, but it's not all the same level of uh, difficulty to understand. Some of it's very easy, some of it is much harder, which he, the Bible itself admits. And that's what this phrase at the end of verse 33, as they were able to bear it, or to hear it, as they were able to hear it. People... In the, in the Christian church, the Holy Christian Church, the kingdom of God, are at different levels of faith and different levels of knowledge of God's truth. And some are more able to hear the harder parts of it than others. Some are what the Bible calls baby believers, some are adolescents, some are mature, and some are even senior citizens in their understanding. And uh, Jesus uh, taught to the level of his audience. And as it says at the end of verse 34, he expounded all things to his disciples. Times he would speak to great crowds, 
like at the beginning of this chapter on the Galilee Lake shore. And sometimes he would just talk to people one-on-one -on -one or in smaller groups. And he would adjust the level of his teaching based on who he was talking to because he knows us perfectly. He knows what our level of knowledge of his truth is. So uh, we grow, and we're going to talk about that in worship service this morning. We grow in knowledge as we uh, continue on, as God gives us uh, years in this world, as we continue on in his word, continue steadfast in his word, as one of the Reformation hymns says. We grow in knowledge. And, and we were reminded of things that we might have learned before and forgot. And so it builds, it grows like a, like a growing plant. And uh, Jesus wants us to understand his word. That's why he, he, he spoke in parables. He could have spoken that would cross the eyes of Albert Einstein. His knowledge is perfect and he created all things. I mean, he, he knows physics perfectly and chemistry perfectly and all these supposedly difficult subjects. But out of his mercy and love for us, he gets down to our level and he, he talks in parables often. Examples, comparisons uh, to help us better understand. And this is also a, a good template for pastors and teachers in the church. Uh, we should follow Jesus' example in this and use lots of examples and, and uh, illustrations, comparisons. Do you have a question, Andy? Yes. Oh, okay, that's all right. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand or whatever. Uh, that's something we can do in a Bible class we can't do in worship, right? You can't raise your hand during a sermon. <laughs> but you can do it in Bible class. Okay, so... Anyway, the Bible does talk about some being baby believers and novices who have a rudimentary grasp of the simple basics of the Bible, simple basics of the gospel. They know that they're sinners and cannot save themselves. Heaven is a free gift of God through Christ Jesus. Maybe that's all. Uh, that's faith, but it's a, it's a rudimentary faith. And the Bible calls them baby believers, and, and they can only catch on to Simple things in the Bible at first. They have to grow on that foundation. Uh, and such we would say would be new converts who, who have just come to faith. Unfortunately, sometimes there are people who came to faith years ago and never did grow. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's sick. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not growing, you're, you're sick. You have a sick faith, and you need to get into the Word of God. Uh, the Bible teaches that these people who are novices, who are just understanding the basics of the Bible, they should not be teachers. They should not be pastors. Uh, that's why we have high school, college, seminary, that only those who are well trained in the scriptures throughout uh, should be teachers in the church lest we be uh, subject to all kinds of false doctrines. As one spends more time studying scripture, he should grow in knowledge. He should grow in insight into the higher things of God, the deeper things of the Bible. Jesus knows everyone's heart and he adapts his teachings to each one at whatever stage in learning one may be at. If you're talking to somebody who is a new convert, use the simple things in scripture. If you're talking to somebody who's much more advanced in their biblical knowledge, you can go into the deeper things. That's what Jesus did. Each believer should master more and more of the Bible compared to when he first came to faith. We should be able to look back and say, well, I know a lot more of the Bible now than I did when I was confirmed or when I was a five-year-old or whatever. 
many years before uh, when I first came to faith. You shouldn't stay a baby believer, as it says in Ephesians 4, but the children, babes should become children, children should become adolescents, then mature adults, and then finally the elders, what the Bible calls them. And this is a process of constantly, daily studying the Bible. It has nothing to do with chronological age, this mastery of the Bible. You could have a, an older person who is a baby believer. You could have a, a teenager who's a, almost ready to be an elder in the church. So it's not chronological we're talking, I'm talking about knowledge of scripture. However, we should all be humble and humbly acknowledge that we can always grow more. We're never done studying the Bible. Like I said, it's a big book. And no one, not even Martin Luther, ever said he had learned it all. And he had mastered it all. Uh, so when we study it, we, we learn more every time. And we could never say, I've learned enough, I don't need to study it anymore. Then verse 34, but without a parable spake he not unto them. That means uh, that he always used parables. That doesn't mean he only used parables. Obviously that's not true. We have many very clear sayings of Jesus, doctrinal statements and so forth, but what this is saying is that he always used parables, inserting them into his teaching, inserting them into his clear doctrinal statements. And then the last phrase there, verse 34, when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Uh, you might say he had Bible studies with his disciples, like we're having here today. Uh, he'd preach sermons to great crowds, but he'd have Bible studies with his disciples. What's a disciple of Jesus, by the way? Huh? A believer. How does that differ from an apostle? An apostle was uh, handpicked by Jesus. Well, we're all handpicked by Jesus as believers, but handpicked to do what? Okay, and then, and then to do what? I mean, to like go out and spread the word. Okay, well, all disciples are to do that. But this, we had back in the previous chapter of Mark listing the 12 apostles. They were disciples, but they were special disciples insofar as they were handpicked by Jesus to be the foundation of the New Testament era church and most specifically, to write the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Once the last apostle left this world and went to heaven, the New Testament was finished. There, we need no more in the Bible. We have all we need now. The prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New. So. Just because you're a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean now you get special revelations from God and you can write another book of the Bible. That was for just the apostles. Okay, so uh, sometimes Jesus would take the apostles aside. Sometimes he'd take just three of them aside. So let's, let's uh, look at some other Bible verses here that talk about this. Right back in verse 10 of this chapter, for example, when he got done with that sermon, which included the parable of the different soils. Verse 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked of him the parable. So that's, that's a private meeting, not with the great multitude that was on the seashore. So sermons were open to the public. Anybody can go to them. But he often had these private meetings. 
For example, go back to chapter 6. We will see that coming up here. Chapter 6, verse 30. 6.30, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. So he wanted to get alone with the apostles a lot and give them private instruction. He would teach them things that he wouldn't say to the great masses because the masses weren't ready for it yet. But the apostles hopefully were. Uh, chapter 9 in Mark. Chapter 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh, taketh with him Peter and James and John, all three apostles, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before. He didn't do that before a great crowd of thousands of people. He just did it before three apostles. He had a special reason for doing that. Go down to verse 28 in that same chapter 9. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out, cast out a demon? So he got another private meeting. Uh, with his disciples apart from the crowds. Many times as, as a pastor or teacher in the church, we deal with people one-on-one, -on -one, not just preaching to the congregation on Sunday. Or we have small meetings with just a few people. Whatever. Pastors, teachers should be ready to teach one-on-one, -on -one or great crowds, just like Jesus. Chapter 13 in Mark, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? He had just talked to them about, down in Jerusalem, about the temple. Uh, being destroyed and so forth. And uh, so when they, when they got alone, privately up on the Mount of Olives, they, they had a chance to ask him questions, which you couldn't do in a large group. The, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where's the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible? Who can tell me? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 1. Who was the Sermon on the Mount preached to? Was it preached to a great crowd of people? You hear the word sermon and you think, oh, that must have been a big crowd of people. No. Look at who it was preached to or taught to. Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. He wanted to get away from the multitudes. So he goes up on a mountain. He knew that the crowds couldn't follow him up there. He wanted to be alone. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So the only ones who heard the Sermon on the Mount were his smaller band of disciples, the apostles and a few other uh, disciples or followers of Jesus. You know, Sermon on the Mount is all law. There's no gospel in it. The only place you could maybe find the gospel is in the Lord's Prayer, which is in the Sermon on the Mount, where it says, forgive us our trespasses. But outside it, it's all law. And isn't that interesting? When he is alone with his disciples, it's all law. Um, importance of the law shouldn't be neglected. Jesus is teaching us there. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 1. This is uh, Jesus beginning his public ministry. 
he begins by going over to the Jordan River where John the Baptist is preaching and baptizing. He goes there to begin by being baptized by John and also to pick up his first disciples. Because remember, John is the forerunner of the Messiah to prepare the way of the Messiah. And John has gathered about him some believers, some apostles, some uh, disciples. And now his job is to pass his disciples off to Jesus. So as soon as he recognizes that Jesus is the promised Messiah, he starts telling his disciples, now you go follow Jesus. That happens in John 1. Notice how this happens. John 1, 37. And the two disciples heard him, meaning John the Baptist, speak, and they followed Jesus. Because what had John said in the previous verse? Behold the Lamb of God, pointing to Jesus. So these two disciples of John now become disciples of Jesus, two of them. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, uh, go gather a big crowd together. I'm going to preach to a big crowd. Is that what it says? No, he says to these two men, what seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master or teacher, where dwellest thou? Where dwellest thou? They want to go where? They want to go to his house, <laughs> wherever he's currently abiding. Uh, that's not a big crowd. They want to talk to him what? Privately. And verse 39, say, no, 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 no. I, I need to be left alone in my house. That's my sanctuary. That's my refuge. No. He said to them, come and see. Very hospitable, isn't he? They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about, about the 10th hour. So he just deals with them one-on-one, -on -one, or two-on-two, -two. you know, one-on-two. He's not averse to that. Remember Mary and Martha, he was just teaching Mary by herself. But wherever he taught, whether it's a great thousands, or one person, or anything in between, he would always use examples. He would explain and expound his great truths in a simple form of comparison. Getting down to our level. Doesn't want it to be way above our heads so he'd impress us with how much he knows. No, he loves us and wants us to know and to understand these truths of God. Okay. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, he would like to get together with small groups or even individuals because there they could ask him questions. And we saw examples of that already here, didn't we? They said, Jesus, why couldn't we ex exercise these demons? Do you, Jesus, would you expound what this parable means? You know, give him a chance to answer, ask questions. So, I think Bible study is so important in our church because here you can ask questions. But you can't do in worship. So take advantage of that. Uh, so, yeah, here in Mark, he, Jesus would expound all things. They would ask him questions. They would say, what did you mean by that when you taught that? Or when will these things be that you're prophesying will happen? They took advantage of this to ask him questions, and he, he welcomed these questions. And he, he, he'd answer their questions in these small groups. He wanted them to understand his teachings, not to be impressed by his knowledge to understand his teachings. Let's go to the book of Luke for a moment. Luke chapter 24. You know, this is something that, uh, since it's Reformation Sunday, this is what Luther wanted. 
and that was not happening in the church. He wanted the, the average person to understand the Bible, not just to read it, but to understand it. Bible study was very important to Luther, for everybody, not just for the clergy or the higher-ups in the, in the church hierarchy. It was for everyone, and that's why he translated into German, both Old and New Testament. And he wanted everybody to read it in their homes and then to be able to take it to church and look at it during the sermon and even have Bible studies like we're doing to this day. Luke 24, Luke 24, verse 13. And I want you to look at this picture behind me. What is this a picture of? Emmaus, and what is the day that this is being pictured here? Uh, he just had from the That's right. It's what we call Easter Sunday. It's in the afternoon. He had risen from the dead and appeared to many people that day. And now there's these two disciples going back to the little town of Emmaus, about 10 miles from Jerusalem. They're walking back in the afternoon to their house. And all of a sudden, Jesus just starts walking with them. And what does he do? Does he he's talking about the weather? Or is he talking about Emmaus? They was talking about the events of the Yeah, they he asked them, What are you talking about? And they said they didn't recognize him, so <laughs> are you the only one in Jerusalem doesn't know what's going on, what all the talk is about? About Jesus of Nazareth and how he was crucified, and now they say he's risen from the dead. Don't you know these things, man? They didn't recognize him. And what does Jesus start to do with them? He yeah, he starts to expound the, the scripture, the Old Testament, to them how these things must be, how they were all prophesied. He fulfilled all the prophecies. He's teaching them. He's having a Bible study with them. Well, here it's recorded in Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all those things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And what did they talk about? Go down to verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He wants us to understand these things. Individual people, not great crowds. He just meets with two guys for, who knows, an hour, two hours? We don't know. But they, God loves each individual person. Each individual person is precious in the sight of God. And he wants to save every person. He wants every person to come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, let's go back to chapter 19 here in Luke for a minute. There's another good example of Jesus teaching on a person's level, where, where they're at. Uh, getting down to that level, whether they're novices or unbelievers or elders. Uh, Luke 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. What's going on here? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, climbed up into the tree so he could see Jesus as a short man. Uh -huh. Is Zacchaeus a believer at this point? Is he a disciple of Jesus? No. no, but he's curious. He's heard about him, heard about his miracles and so forth, his influence. He's living down there in Jericho, not in Jerusalem. 
Might be the chief tax collector of Jericho, for all we know. He's a rich man. And, uh, but he's curious, and he's a little short guy, so he climbs up in a tree along the, the road where Jesus is to pass. And Jesus could just walked on by, but he didn't. Jesus knows Zacchaeus. He knows us all. And he knows our names. And he knew Zacchaeus' name, and he knew all about him, just like the woman at the well in Samaria. And he stops under the tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, come on down from that tree. I want to go to your house. One-on-one, he wants to teach him. And so it goes on. Verse 6, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Received means gave him hospitality, opened his his home to Jesus, let let Jesus into his house. Jesus knocks on the door, and uh, uh, Zacchaeus didn't make the mistake of saying, no, Jesus, you can't come to my house. No, he let him come into his house. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner, because he's a tax collector. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. What's a son of Abraham? Yeah, a true son of Abraham is a believer. The Bible says Abraham's the father of all believers. Uh, he's not talking about physical descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's talking about spiritual. All true believers are sons of Abraham. That day, Zacchaeus had become a spiritual son of Abraham. What does that mean? What did Jesus talk to him about in Zacchaeus' house? That's right. And how to be saved. That he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, who is soon to die on a cross for his sins. And did Zacchaeus believe it? By the power of the Holy Ghost, yes. He believed it. Jesus said so here. One guy. Jesus takes his time to go to his house that day and teach him the law and the gospel. That's the way Jesus is. That's the way God is. And I imagine he used some parables that day because Jesus never taught without using parables. How about the Apostle Paul? Go to the book of Acts. Last chapter of Acts. The end of the book of Acts, chapter 28. The Apostle Paul. Did the Apostle Paul, did he speak to great crowds? Yeah. Did he speak to individuals? Yeah, just like Jesus. Acts 28, verse 17. Acts 28, 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, being a Roman citizen, Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of, the Jews. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you. Because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. What's the hope of Israel? Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah. They've been waiting for the Messiah for thousands of years. And he is the fulfillment of that. And they said unto him, the Jewish leaders, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, 
But we desire of, we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, what's the sect? Yeah, the, the Christianity, the Christian religion. We called it a sect back then. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. This is in Rome, you know. Verse 23, and when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he, what? Expounded and testified the kingdom of God it's what Jesus did in those four parables in Mark 4, isn't it? Persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. What's Moses and the prophets? He expounded to them Moses and the prophets. What's that? The Old Testament. The Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He simply said, let's, get, let's have a Bible study in my home with you Jewish leaders. And how long did the Bible study go? All day. All day. It's important. 24, and some believe the things which are spoken and some believe not. Well, that's the way it is, isn't it? <laughs> that's what the parable of the four different soils was all about. Some is hard path, some is good ground, some is in between. All different kinds of ways that people receive the word of God. But the important thing here is that small group Bible studies were important to Jesus, were important to Paul, and are always important in the church. And so going back to Mark 4, that verse 30, uh, 34, but without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Boy, Bible study. It's where you can expound all things, expound everything in the Bible. And if you don't fully understand something, you have a chance to go back and forth on it. That's what Jesus did, that's what Paul did, that's what we still do here today. So we have that little section here, verses 33 and 34, kind of wrapping up this section in Mark 4 with the four parables. Jesus teaching. How did he teach? Who did he teach? And so forth. Okay, for the last five minutes, I want to give you a little introduction to the last section of Mark 4, because we go shift gears now to a totally different thing. This isn't a parable, and it's going to lead right into chapter 5. Chapter 4 of Mark begins with four parables. It ends with a great miracle performed by Jesus, and then goes into chapter 5 with three more great astounding miracles. So you've got four parables, followed by four great miracles. That's what you have in Mark 4 and 5. So here's the first of the great miracles, beginning in 35, verse 35 here, and going to the end of the chapter. And what is the great miracle here? Jesus stops a storm while crossing to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, on the map here, what we've been studying so far in Mark 4 takes place up here. There's the Sea of Galilee. Here's Galilee in the yellow, Judea down here in the pink, with Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Emmaus and all that. And then here's Samaria in the purple in between, the Samaritans. But Jesus, he spends most of his time up here. He was raised up here, Nazareth. And here's the Sea of Galilee. Spent a lot of time around here because here's Capernaum. That's the big city on the Sea of Galilee on the northwest side. Jesus' house was there. That's where he lived. 
And most of the apostles lived up here and came from this area. Well, what we've just been reading in Mark 4 all occurred up here. You know, it started with him on the sea coast, going out in the boat into the, into the lake, and the great multitude on the shore listening to him. That occurred up here. And all these other things we've just been looking at, the parables and the meeting privately with the apostles and so forth. Now, he's going to go from here down to here. He's going to cross the entire Sea of Galilee down to this area where it says Gadara. That's where he, this is the big city of this region down here. While they're crossing the sea, they're, they're going to start in the evening when it's getting dark, and in the morning, sometime they're going to land over here. But in the meantime, a tremendous, tremendous storm is going to happen on the Sea of Galilee. And it's going to be described in great detail here at the end of chapter 4. Jesus had just taught the multitudes and the disciples about what? What did he say? What did he compare all these things to? He says, what will I compare the what to? The kingdom of God. Yeah, you look at all four of those parables, he's talking about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God like? Well, we know what the kingdom of God is. It's the Holy Christian Church, both here on earth and in heaven. His kingdom is all the believers. And the parables were about the kingdom of God happens, how? How does, it, how does it come into existence? How does it happen? The parables teach us what? The kingdom of God happens when what happens? But how do people come to faith? That's the point. Yeah, when the word of God is cast into the ground, when the word of God is cast at people, that's how the church comes about. The, the word of God is, is the seed of the Christian church. It's the Bible, the inspired works of the apostles and prophets. Okay, that's, it only comes about by spreading God's word. However, does that mean everybody receives that word of God in the same way? No. That's what the first parable in the chapter taught. You got the hard path, you got the stony ground, you got the weedy ground, and you got the good ground. Everybody receives it differently. But the important thing is that you keep receiving it. Keep receiving it. Keep hearing it. Keep, as long as God leaves you on this earth, you keep in the word of God. That brings you to faith, that keeps you in faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is the one thing needful, he told Mary. Well, you got the apostles here, the 12. They've been hearing the word of God. What are we going to see about the apostles in this crossing of the Sea of Galilee? We're going to see how much effect the word of God has had on them so far. And we're going to find out what? They were afraid. Yeah, their faith was very small. Even though they've been hearing Jesus teach publicly and privately now for a year or more, they've been following him and witnessing him. And even them their faith was still very small. What does that tell us about us? We should all start with a small faith. But we should all keep in it. If the apostles who were taught by Jesus himself, even after a year or more of his teaching them personally, had a very small faith, that should tell us our faith is small. Don't get puffed up with pride. 
don't think I don't need the Bible anymore. Because you're going to see this storm arise here all of a sudden in the darkness of the Sea of Galilee as these fishermen, many of them fishermen there, experienced fishermen. And yet what happens? Verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, meaning Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we what? They're on the verge of death. They are that close to dying and drowning. And... Uh, of course, Jesus calms the storm, and then he says in verse 40, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Their faith was so small, Jesus said, It's like, in this instance anyway, you had no faith at all. So they're kind of like what here? In terms of the parables. They're kind of like the the weedy ground. You know, they come to faith, but the cares of this world choke out their faith. So there's lots of lessons to learn in this great account we're coming to now of the storm that Jesus stops. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.